Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome back to another review. Today I've got a mighty Great Western steam locomotive from Hornby. <music> Five years ago I did a review of the Hornby King Class and I guess you could say I liked that model because I gave it full marks, 10 out of 10. Now as a reviewer that's a really embarrassing thing to do because when you give a model full marks you are saying that that model is perfect and there is no way in the world in which it could be improved and I'm not convinced that that is possible but I was a foolish teenager five years ago that's what I thought. Was I correct? Well, more recently I have bought this. This is a new Hornby King class. This one is King Edward V. And today we're gonna to find out whether I got it right or whether I was slightly too excited about my new King class. Now, obviously things have moved on a little bit since the five-year-old review that I made. I think the standard of models these days is much higher. So I'm definitely not expecting to give this loco full marks. But if it got full marks five years ago, surely it's got to be a great model. Surely it's got to be well worth a look. Five years ago, I paid £113 for my King Class, and that actually included TTS sound. It was a sound-fitted locomotive. I'm not sure what the RRP was back then, but today, for the latest Hornby King Class, the RRP is £224.99. I think this was the previous model, this one I've got right here. This was from a year or two earlier. I think the RRP was a little bit less for that. But it doesn't much matter because I managed to pick this one up from the model centre at a very reduced rate of £91.50. Now that is crazy for a loco of this size, for a loco that is supposedly a 10 out of 10 model. Well, let's take a fresh look at it here in 2022 and we'll find out whether that is still the case. All right, the mighty King Class. Of course, the ultimate Great Western steam locomotive. No other engine ever exceeded these, as far as I know. And according to me, five years ago, it's also the ultimate double-O gauge model as well. So this ought to be interesting, didn't it? Anyway, let me show you the end of the box. So the version I have today is R3408. It is a Great Western King Class. It is King Edward V, and it is number 6016. And this is in the Great Western Green, and it's got the little shirt button, is that the Great Western logo on the tender. Right, let me show you the back of the box, because there's quite a bit of info on these. Classified as an 8P, so that gives you an idea of how mighty these engines were. An 8P for a 460, that's amazing. In the middle, a brief history of the class, feel free to pause and read that if you want to. And then you've got Hornby's line drawings on the other end there, dated 2014, so about eight years ago now. Uh, crikey, doesn't time fly? I can actually remember these models first coming out. Wow, that was eight years ago. Anyway, well, it's today now, so let's take this out and let's take a fresh look at the Hornby King. All right, so there it is. The livery looks a little different from the box, doesn't it? Let's have a look. Yeah, it seems quite a bit lighter on the box. Uh, a more realistic, I would say, Brunswicky green on the actual loco itself. Cool. Looking forward to this, folks. I tell you what, I really am. Gorgeous, gorgeous engines. So I'll pull out the blister pack if I can. It's a bit sticky. Okay. Wow, very, very tight. All right. And the instructions are stuck to the back of it. Here we go. All right, let's take a look at the operating and maintenance instructions. Uh, glossy paper for a change. That's uh, an improvement, isn't it? So this is for the King class. Let's take a look inside. It looks fairly standard, doesn't it? Lubrication just shows you where to lubricate. Fitting of the accessories. Looks like it includes buffer beam detail, couplings and cylinder drain cocks. Body removal. Yeah, fairly standard. Looks like a screw, a couple of screws maybe. DCC socket is in the tender. Looks like an 8-pin socket. And on the back, you've got a little bit about brake rods. And uh, I don't believe the brake rods are fitted as standard. Uh, no, I can see them right there. So they're an optional extra if you want to fit those yourself. Right, let's pull this out then. And we'll, well, we'll start with the accessories bag, because we always do. Let's take a look then. So it's a resealable bag this time by the looks of it, and that's nice. 
and as expected we've got brake rigging, cylinder drain cocks which have been painted, vacuum pipes, an M coupling for the front of the loco with the hook broken off it and unexpectedly what look like a set of etched number plates. Now <laughs> that gives you some idea of what a premium model we're dealing with here. It's very rare that Hornby would include such a thing. Uh, but they look quality, don't they? Lovely etched number plates. So it uh, begs the question, why haven't we got etched nameplates to match? Does that mean the ones on the loco are metal? I don't know. We'll find out. Okay, let's take a look then. So one thing that has improved massively in this hobby since 2017 is obviously the difficulty of the packaging because uh, this is really stiff. Uh, I got it. No, it is the finish, of course, of the different uh, paint jobs. Uh, they tend to be a lot glossier today. They tend to look a bit more quality than they did back then. And yeah, sure enough, this one is looking a little bit on the plasticky side. Doesn't have that quality sheen that you'd expect of a modern loco. But it's not the end of the world. It can still be a well-detailed piece. So let's pull this out. Cool. Oh, it's very heavy, I've got to say. Yeah, this is a very, very heavy engine. I'd forgotten that. All right, so here it is, up close for you, the elegant Hornby King class, with its very unconventional front bogey design, the frontmost axle there having the axle boxes on the outside. It's a very odd design. Despite the weight, though, the Loco does just have a plastic running plate. Hopefully it's straight. It looks it for the time being, but I will check later on. And a, and a plastic body as well. So it is just the chassis that is die-cast and very heavy too, obviously, because uh, yeah, it's, it's a heavy engine, like I say. But this looks excellent. Yeah, the level of detail is clearly wonderful. At a glance, the build quality looks good, but I'll talk more about that in just a second. First though, let's have a bit of history on the lovely King class in real life, and then we'll take a closer look at this and some of its details. All right, let's do it. The GWR King class, also known as the 6000 class, was first introduced to the design of Charles Collett in 1927. 31 of these powerful four-cylinder locomotives were built over the following nine years or so, and powerful was definitely the word, these weighed in at almost 140 tonnes, and they produced a tractive effort around 180 kilonewtons. This would make the Kings the largest and most powerful Great Western locomotives ever to be built. The King would be the last of a very long line of developments to Churchwood's original Star Class, which was a similar looking 460 locomotive. Said development saw several other classes of steam locomotive come and go, a notable example being the Mighty Castle class, which was the final development before the King, and it was the one on which the King was ultimately based, really. The King, though, saw an increase in boiler pressure to 250 psi, a larger cylinder stroke of 711 mm, up from 660 on the Castle, and slightly smaller wheels, which increased the torque and also allowed for an even larger boiler. Finally though, the class was withdrawn from service in 1962, when all but three examples were very sadly scrapped. Those three though, still do remain in preservation until this day. So there she is, up close and personal for you, the beautiful Hornby King class. And I've got to say, this is still a cracking locomotive, even after all of this time, still looks like a fantastic model. I don't think it's a 10 out of 10 model anymore, that's certainly not true, but I can certainly see why the me of five years ago spoke very highly of this loco, because it's wonderful. One thing that I wasn't aware of five years ago, something that's only become apparent now, is the number of model variations that Hornby have incorporated into the tooling, something that you only really appreciate properly when you see two different models next to each other. So obviously this new loco I'm looking at today is in earlier Great Western condition. The one I looked at last time was a slightly later BR condition King class. And the number of differences between the two models is quite staggering, very impressive. So this new King, for instance, has a single chimney, as is correct for this example in this period. The BR1 had the double chimney. They've got different cabs. This has got the earlier cab without the opening vents. My BR1 had a more modern cab with opening vents. Uh, this one, the early Great Western one, doesn't have the mechanical lubricators because they were added later on, but those are depicted on the later BR version. There's tons of differences like that when you look for them. The livery is considerably different as well. If you look, we've got lining on the firebox here on the Great Western version, whereas we didn't on the other. 
And there's actually more ornate lining on this as well. All the steps and such have lining on them. And the cylinders are particularly well decorated. Look at those with all the silver paintwork. They stand out excellently. So let's start looking at what this model is actually like then. And we will start with the decoration because I think the finish is one thing that would cause me to reduce the score of this Loco these days. This is definitely quite a plasticky looking model compared to what you tend to get these days. That said, the decoration itself is pretty decent. All of the lining on the boiler and the firebox this time all looks very, very good. Uh, the splashes are fully decorated too. You've got the lovely gold paintwork. Uh, the King Edward nameplate, I believe that is a metal piece. Uh, I don't know about etched, but definitely made of metal, so that's a quality feature. Even the internal cylinders have been painted as well, which is a really, really good look, I think. The side of the cab is beautiful as well, so much lining, all very, very crisp and accurate. And don't forget there is an alternative etched number plate that you can fit to the side of the cab if you want to, even though the existing Tampo printed one looks pretty good. This model does fall down though on details such as the chimney. That's not a real copper chimney, that is just painted plastic. Modern high-spec models tend to have real copper chimneys like that. And the same is true with the safety valve bonnet. I mean, we've got the likes of Dapol these days who have started electroplating parts like that to give them a realistic shine, whereas this one is just painted plastic. And the same is true of the whistles as well, just plastic whistles don't quite have the same quality finish as real metal. Another slight letdown is the plastic running plate. Obviously, a more modern quality feature would be to have that die cast. To be fair though, that is not a massive complaint for me because I paid significantly less than £100 for this Loco and the running plate is straight, as you can see, and the weight of the model is decent as well. It comes in at 387 grams, which is around the same as a Hornby Pacific, so it's not lacking in weight. However, do bear in mind that the latest RRP for these Locos is £224.99, and at that price you want every possible feature, and so if you'd paid that, I would be quite puzzled as to why the running plate and the bodywork for that matter is just made of plastic. But at the significantly reduced prices, which are quite common actually, if you look around, I don't think that's much of an issue at all. It really is the level of detail though that makes this model shine, so let's take a look at some of this. So you've got very fine handrails across the loco, all of which look excellent. Over on the other side, you've got quite intricate looking pipework, as well as a separately fitted and real metal reversing rod, which I think looks really, really good. The buffer beams are complete with coupling hooks. Sadly, no chain link or screw link couplings to fit onto those. Again, at the newest and highest prices, I really think Hornby should be including those. But we do have the metal separately fitted buffers, which are sprung. Of course they are. <laughs> there we go. The smoke box door is fairly good looking as well. You've got a nice and straight separately fitted smoke box dart, lamp irons and a little tiny molded tap on the left hand side there. Here's a better look at the really unusual front bogey design. It might even be a unique one to the King class. And it is a die cast assembly and incidentally you can see the quality of the finish on that piece is far higher than on other parts of the model, but it is well decorated and well molded. Again, it's got all of that detail and also the lining on it, which looks excellent. The wheels are quite nice. They're molded plastic wheels with slightly more realistic centers than you see from other brands. And the piston assembly, as well as the coupling and connecting rods, all looks nice and realistic. And I know from experience how good all of this looks when it runs. There is a depiction of the valve gear and the internal cylinders underneath the boiler. Lovely amount of detail under there. It's just such a high quality feature, isn't it? Lovely pipe work underneath the cab, which is all separately painted. You've got flush glazing on the outside of the cab and the inside of the cab is absolutely wonderful. You've got this hinged tender full plate, which you can push down towards the tender, which is awesome. And then a massive array of cab detail. Pipe work all being picked out. You've got a separately fitted regulator rod, separately fitted reverser. All of the gauges have been fully painted. This was the case five years ago as well, folks, and it really doesn't get much better than this. It's a very, very impressive cab. So it's very easy to see why I gave this a five on detail all those years ago. I think these days we see Locos with a better finish, with better separately fitted components, which look a bit more realistic. So it's not a five anymore, but the level of detail is certainly still very impressive. 
Let's take a look at the tender then, which is still decorated really nicely. It's got that same plasticky finish as the Loco, but at least the lining and such is all nice and precise. And on this Great Western example, there is some lining on the underframe as well, which helps some of the details down there to stand out. Nice moulding on the axle boxes and the springs. And you can also clearly see there is a water scoop fitted underneath. The tender even has metal buffers on the front of it. That's a really nice feature, not just molded plastic ones. I don't think those are sprung, although of course the ones on the back are. You've got a separately fitted coal load, which is removable because it moves around a little bit. So that's a nice option. Few cab controls on the front, the fairly standard issue stuff really. Then around the back, you've got more separately fitted handrails, little steps, which also appear to be separately fitted to the back of the tender. And this time we've got a pre-fitted vacuum pipe which sits alongside the coupling hook, again bare with no coupling on it, and also the little fine lamp irons which sit next to the buffers. And then the rear coupling itself is pre-fitted to the tender and it is free to pivot very slightly, which allows it to negotiate curves. So, wow, it is still a very, very impressive model. Very close, I think, to being up to modern standards. And when you consider it dates back around eight years now, I think it's still a great, great loco. Definitely not worth what it costs at the RRP, but if you do some shopping around, you can still find these at a very reasonable price. And I think anything up to £150 for this is pretty much bargain territory, isn't it? But that's only visually. How do the locos run? I've only ever owned a DCC fitted version of this. So how do they run on analog? What's the mechanism like? Well, let's find out. So there she is, the Hornby King Class down onto the track. And I've already filmed the first performance test, so I'll show you that shortly. Gotta say though, it is not what I expected, and that's all I'm gonna say for the time being. Mechanically though, at least on paper, this is perfectly good, pretty much up to Hornby's usual standards. So it's great on pickups, all of the loco driving wheels have pickups on them, and all of the tender wheels have pickups on them. So that's six pickups per rail, that's absolutely fantastic. So it's gonna have good continuity to the track. It's got the standard Hornby drawbar design, which is not a great design, but it works, it's fine, it is what it is. The base keeper plate is easy to remove with I think it was four screws, and it is not hardwired to the chassis, which means you can lift the base keeper plate away from the loco to access and clean the pickups, and it leaves the bearings and the axles free to be serviced as well. Proper turn bearings on the axles, as you can see, and yes, there are spring-loaded contacts for the pickups to connect to the chassis. Removing the body kind of reveals why this loco is so heavy, because there's this massive block over the motor mount, uh, which is all die-cast, so that's why the loco is so heavy. This is the motor, it is a five-pole motor. It's used in quite a few Hornby locos, but it's not the large, substantial motor that you tend to find in a loco of this size. In some cases, I've known this motor to run excellently, but in other cases, I've known it to not quite perform as well as the larger motor in, let's say, a Hornby Pacific. Also, notice that the brushes, the electrical end, if you will, of the motor, is the same end as the worm drive. And generally, I'm not a fan of this design because the worm drive, the gears, those are the parts that get lubricated, and if the lubricant finds its way onto the brushes, you get problems. So it's much better, I think, to have the brushes on the other end of the motor, um, and there's, there may be a reason why I'm mentioning that today. Anyway, removing the gear cover just reveals the brass worm drive. There is no flywheel on this motor, unfortunately, and that is really the only key mechanical issue that I identified. Besides that, it's a fairly basic box standard chassis, no lights or anything like that to speak of. The gauge seems just about fine, comes in at 14.2 to 14.3 millimeters back to back on each of the driving wheels. So, like I say, on paper, the mechanism is perfectly good, top notch from Hornby. Now though, let's move on to the performance. All right then, well, let's find out how this performs on analog. I know that these are wonderful performers on DCC, but uh, things can be different on analog, can't they? So forwards direction, please. Let's see if the loco actually works. Here we go. Ooh, <laughs> little bit of a, a ropey start there, but uh, I don't know how long this loco has been sat in its box for. It could just be that a good run in is all this needs to uh, sort itself out but uh, quite juddery. In fact, I think that noise was coming from the front bogey design. I think it was uh, sort of jumping around, but it seems fairly smooth. That there is 50% speed and uh, 
yeah, I think that seems pretty good, actually. Pretty good and realistic. Obviously, it can go a lot faster if you want to do an express speed, so I don't see anything wrong with that. Um, yeah, like I say, not running at the moment. It will need about 30 minutes in each direction <laughs> before it's at its best. Sounds like a right rattler, though, doesn't it? Uh, anyway, let's try and sustain a crawl <laughs> straight out of the box, uh, see what the actual crawl is like. Let's see. I don't think it's going to be very good, is it, based on what I've just seen? But we'll, go, we'll give it a go. Oh. Mm. A bit more. Okay. So awful. Absolutely awful crawl. And that's strange because uh, I'm pretty sure it was a very, very good performer. Uh, well, the, the DCC one I had. Um, so perhaps running these things on analog uh, really exposes the weaker mechanisms because, of course, I've got loads of engines that run much better than this, even on analog. Um, but no conclusions. No, I will let it run in before drawing one. But uh, yeah, at the moment, that's pretty ropey, isn't it? Definitely not a five-star performer at the moment. Okay, 50 speed, let's see how it gets on. Ooh. Seems to be perfectly smooth at this speed, though, it must be said. Uh, ooh, definitely a bit of a slowdown on the curve there. Uh, but it's staying on the track, at least, and uh, away from the curves, it seems like quite a, a smooth, decent performer. But there's definitely some work to do for this logo, isn't there? Uh, I'm hoping to see a bit more torque around the curves and definitely a much better crawl. Good luck, King Class. You've got around an hour to fix these issues. And hopefully, when we come back, this will be the five-star performer that my 2017 King Class was. All right, well, we'll see how that transpires. I'll be back with you shortly. Okay, folks, well, that is running in complete. And, uh, yeah, I've got to say, I'm not feeling good about this at all. I, I do suspect that there is some sort of fault with this. Uh, the crawl was terrible. At one point during the running in, I put my fingers in front of the loco and just let it push against them just to see what sort of torque there was. And the wheel stopped completely at 50% power. No power there at all. I think now it seems slightly better if I give this 50%. As you can see, it's actually turning its wheels quite well with a fair bit of power. So I suspect that things have improved during running in, uh, but how this is going to cope with the coaches, I'm not too sure. When I measured the pulling power, it was while the wheels were just stopping completely. So I got only 0.36 newtons, which is around 23 coaches. But I'll measure that again now that the wheels seem to be turning better and uh, see if it's any more. Anyway, how is the crawl? Because it was really quite diabolical earlier on, wasn't it? So, yeah, still massively cogging. Look at that. It's the worst cogging I think I've ever seen. <laughs> you can clearly see each sudden rotation of the motor there. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm suspecting that there might be something wrong with this. Let's try it forwards. Yeah, it's very much the same. Um, and like I say, I was I was convinced that this was, you know, badly faulty, badly faulty. When I saw the wheels locking up and I saw the lack of torque, now I'm not sure. Now I'm not sure whether it's just the, um, you know, the design of motor, maybe it's just not as good as the larger ones, because it does seem fine at the higher speeds, doesn't it? But if I bring in my DCC King, don't forget it's five years old, I'll show you the difference. All right, oh gosh. Now this is DCC fitted on an awful Hornby Select controller, which is just actually not responding. <sighs> so the train's gone off around the track. Oh, it's stopping now. Great. Let me try and get it queued up in front of the camera for you. Right. I don't know how well this is going. It's not responding again. Right. I'll queue it up manually. <laughs> How's that? Right. <clears throat> Patience, Samuel. Patience. It's running out, got to be honest. Right. Let's see if I can get this thing to crawl. Right, so I've smashed the controller on the ground a few times. That is not a joke. And genuinely, it seems as though it's now working. So if I give this some juice, hopefully now we'll be able to get it to crawl. No. Ah. Right, that controller is going down the loft ladder. And I don't mean I'm taking it down there gently. I'll deal with you later. Right, let's try the 
Hornby Railmaster, which is even more reliable, if memory serves. Where's my hammer? Okay, take 5,365,229. Let's try again, here we go. Okay, well, that wasn't a crawl, but at least it's working. Yeah, it's not easy to squeeze a crawl out of this, but I will try. I think you could probably tell, though, how much smoother this was. Let's try it at a real low speed. Try like three miles an hour. Yes, no? Not registering anything on three. Let's try four or five. No. So, to be fair, <laughs> it's not really slow enough that I would consider it a crawl, but it's clearly a lot smoother, isn't it? Definitely. Can it go any slower? Tried at four, it's gone up to five there. There we are, that's four. And I think that is noticeably better. Now, I know that DCC can bring out better performance in some locos, but it's not gonna make that much of a difference, is it? It's not gonna take a stuttering lame engine and make it into a beautifully smooth crawler. I mean, every, every one of my reviews is shot on analog, uh, unless it's a DCC fitted loco. And uh, yeah, it's not normal on analog. So uh, yeah, I don't want to see comments saying, oh, it's because you're on DCC. No, no, it wouldn't make that much of a difference. And because some people like to argue and they can't take my word on anything, even though as annoying as it is when something's obvious, uh, that's probably a healthy way to be with a reviewer. What I've decided to do is swap the tenders so that this is now my old existing good running King class, but it's on analog with the analog Great Western tender. So let's see what the performance is like with this loco. Is there torque here in this mechanism? Oh yeah. All right, so that's decent. Uh, how, is the how is the crawl in reverse to start with? Oh, okay. <laughs> Cogging a little bit, but nowhere near as bad as the other loco. So uh, there we go, I think I've also been able to prove it. <laughs> New loco, definitely faulty, no doubt about it. Let's try forwards. All right, yeah, so it's not, as, it's not as smooth as you might expect, but it's definitely nowhere near as bad as that other loco was. So my new king, unfortunately, is faulty again. Now, this is the second time that I've had a similar experience to this in a very short period. Uh, that B12 from a few reviews ago, that was almost exactly the same scenario. I bought a loco super cheap, turned out there was something wrong with the motor. Now. Uh, one or two people had the audacity to tell me that I should have expected that, you know, I paid such a low price. Uh, I, it was my fault, it was me being silly expecting a low coat to be fine. Now I think most of you will be able to tell on your own what absolute nonsense that is, but just for the record I'm going to clear it up for you. I cannot express enough how absolutely incorrect that is. It does not matter how much a product is discounted. Unless it is specifically described as faulty, then you should be able to buy it and expect it to work properly. That's it, end of story. It doesn't matter if you agree, I don't care if you disagree. It's not a matter of opinion, it's not up for discussion, it's a matter of law. Now, am I saying that the manufacturer knows that these models are faulty and have let the retailers have them for a discounted price? No, absolutely not. I have no evidence to suggest that. However, this is the second time that this has happened in a relatively short space. I've also bought several other significantly reduced Hornby Locos, which I'm yet to review. So what I can say is that the more often this happens, the harder it's going to be to believe that it's a coincidence because this is more or less how I would expect a loco with this motor to behave. And the juddering mess of the other King I've got is definitely not right. Um, it's better than it was, running in seems to have helped, and it's definitely not as bad as the B12, but it's not performing in the way that a fully working, non-faulty model should. So I'm gonna swap the tenders back over and we'll finish off the review. Okay, so the analog tender is back with the original loco now. <laughs> Yeah, the difference is startling, isn't it? It's stalled there. Oh no. It's weird because it then suddenly transitions. Look at that. You hear it? 
weirdly suddenly transitions to running smoothly as you keep turning it up. At this point it's now running absolutely normally. Anyway, let's see how it performs with coaches. <laughs> let's judder up to them, see if I can attempt a coupling. Not touching the controller now, by the way. <laughs> All right, I'll stop torturing it. Okay, got it. <laughs> Sorry about this, I apologize in advance, passengers. This is not gonna be a pleasant trip. All right, 50. 50. 50. Wow. That, uh, that's not much of a display of torque, is it? Oh, it's speeding up. Right, so on the middle line, I'm going to run the, well, the TTS one that you've seen, but I'm not going to run it with the sound because uh, it's really annoying while I'm trying to <laughs> review something, but uh, it should be able to run on its own quite nicely. Look at that, so much more torque in that mechanism, although it's a bit fast, <laughs> to say the least. Hmm, the new king's not doing ever so well. Should we go and check in on what's happening there? Yes, it's reminding me almost exactly of the B12, but we'll try this again in just a second. And then on the inside line, I've got another king. This is the older Hornby king. Oh, and I've not got one of the coaches on properly. Oh dear. <laughs> I'll bring it up here and then I'll put them back on. Uh, so yeah, this is the previous Hornby King. Uh, it's based on the old Tender Drive King, although this one is loco driven. Interestingly, it has the same motor as the King we're reviewing today, and that too has issues. Uh, I don't know if I over-oiled it in my earlier days, but uh, yeah, it has been known to struggle a bit. Mind you, it hasn't ever died. Uh, I've got a uh, new motor standing by for it, uh, but so far it still clings to life and it actually seems to be pretty much fine today. Uh, so yeah, maybe maybe nothing wrong with it, maybe it's fixed itself, I don't know, but I know another king that's in a serious bad state. Right, so I'm gonna leave the camera there and go back to the controller and give it power again, and uh, I'll turn it up above 50 and see if we can get it to move. Uh, I suppose I'll find out when I watch the footage what happens. So now we're at 60 speed. Oh, I can see the coaches. Okay, so at 60, <laughs> I think it's got enough oomph to actually get itself up the hill. That's not normal. And now, of course, it's running okay because it's on the other side of the room, which is flatter. Slightly downhill, in fact. Let's watch it again up Gordon's Hill. So this is still at 60. I'm hoping this time it will build up enough momentum to get, its, get itself up there. It actually looks fairly normal running like this. It's crazy what 10% on the controller difference can make. See, that looked perfectly normal. Let's try it at 50 again, see what happens. Yeah, it's much slower at 50. I mean, this is only a difference of 10 on the controller. It's quite strange to see such a big difference in the actual performance, <laughs> but look. Yeah, struggling diabolically around the curve. And I think it is gonna do the same as it did a minute ago. Is it gonna grind to a halt again? Like the B12. No, it just slowed right down that time. So it seems it may be getting better. It may, may be getting slightly better as it runs in. Uh, maybe it just needs many, many hours to run in. Uh, but yeah, I'm not convinced that things are quite as they should be. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's as bad as the B12, that's for sure. So what do you think I should do with this, folks? I, I think I might ask you that question. Uh, do you want me to just return it? Is it not worth faffing around with it? Do you want me to experiment with putting different motors into it? Did you enjoy that last time? Uh, do you want me to just replace the motor and fix it? I mean, that's an option because it was a real bargain. Uh, have you got another idea for it? Do you want me to subject it to some evil experiment and uh, give it the punishment it deserves? I don't know. If you've got an idea, comment down below. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's really soul-destroying to say this because you see a bargain locomotive and it's so exciting to find such a good deal and buy the loco. But the last two times I've done that, I've just ended up with a faulty loco. Could be bad luck, even though luck isn't really a thing. But honestly, it see, I, I reckon there's a decent chance that you could end up with a similar problem to me if you do buy these bargain locos at the moment. It's probably still worth doing it. 
but bear in mind, you're probably going to end up having to make a return. And that's what you should do, by the way. I know I'm making all kinds of other suggestions, but if you've got a problem like this, a return is the only sensible option. It's up to you, of course, but um, don't ever settle for a faulty loco. It's a bit different with me because if I make other videos about it, then I make my money back like that. But if you're just buying the loco to enjoy it and you're not buying it to make YouTube videos for a living, then um, there's no reason why you should have to put up with a faulty loco like this. Yeah, it's disappointing, but I don't know, it might get better. It's certainly not as bad as the B12 was, but equally certainly not right. Let's have some ratings then for my Hornby King class. Now, again, this is getting a fairly decent score, like 6.6 .6 out of 10, but it was clearly a faulty model. And if the others are like this, then clearly it's not a model I recommend. But let's talk about the different categories anyway. The level of detail is overall really, really good. Loads and loads of detail on this, a particularly impressive cab, sprung buffers, etc. It loses one star for the plasticky finish, which I don't like very much, and the plastic chimney and safety valve bonnet and that sort of thing, which of course would look much better were they made of metal. <sighs> Performance then. Uh, these models do have the potential to run well. The other King that I had ran fairly well on analog, not the greatest crawl in the world, but it was acceptable, probably a four star, so that's what you can expect normally. My faulty one though obviously can't get more than one star because the crawl is terrible, it's very juddery and there's almost no torque on the layout. Pulling power then, 23 coaches, well take that with a grain of salt because this is struggling to haul 7 up a small incline but again I suspect that's because of the faulty motor. The mechanism gets 4 star, generally there's not a lot wrong with the mechanism and if you get a decent motor, unlike this example, uh, then yeah there's no problem at all. Uh, Full pickups on all of the axles except for the front bogey, bearings on the driving wheels, fully accessible and serviceable chassis, and uh, on paper, fairly good five pole motor. Note though that it's not the same five pole motor that is in some of Hornby's larger engines, perhaps that's contributing to the issues here. The quality then, uh, looking past the poor quality motor, which I've penalized in the performance category, it's not a bad quality loco. The build quality at least was high. The quality of the mechanism, at least on paper, was high. It's just the plasticiness of the loco that I would knock it down for. Diecast running plate, particularly given the latest prices, that's a much better feature. Talking of value then, £224.99 is the RRP for the latest Hornby King. Not this one, I think Hornby have released more Kings since this one. But I bought it for £91.50 from TMC. Had this been a faultless loco, then that would have been an absolute bargain, wouldn't it? But of course it's not. And at the RRP, even if it was a fully working loco, I would struggle to recommend it for that price. So it's not great on value, but uh, you can find these at lower prices if you look. So three and a half on value. Overall then that is 6.6 .6 out of 10. Again, take this score with a pinch of salt because mine didn't work properly and your mileage may vary. Ranking though, let's put this into the logbook and it is 18th place above the 060 Sentinel and below the Hornby Patriot. Now that the review is over and the ratings have been shown, because this loco is so serviceable, I did take a moment just to put some oil on the bearings <laughs> and a little bit on the gear train. I'm laughing because it almost stopped. Uh, just to verify that it's not behaving this way, perhaps because it's been on a shelf for too long and perhaps its moving parts have dried up. And uh, yeah, it's been running for a few minutes since I did that. And <laughs> quite clearly, uh, the improvements, if they exist at all, are very, very difficult to notice and the torque problems are still there. So unless there's something I've missed, it's got to be a motor issue as far as I'm concerned. Tell you what, I'm going to get through my store of motors, aren't I, if I decide to keep it. Well, folks, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this review. Uh, yeah, ultimately, it's just very, very disappointing. I didn't think that this loco would have a problem. I haven't heard loads of stories about these being faulty, um, so I thought I would be okay. It might be just bad luck this time. With the B12, I kind of suspected faults. With this one, it was a complete surprise. It could just be this example that was bad. It's possible. But yeah, I mean, it's up to you. Did you buy one of these at the lower reduced price? If you did, how was it? Please do comment down below and let me know. For now, though, thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next video. All right. Cheers, everybody. Take care.